Greetings, I am D, and happy Friday the 13th! And what better way to celebrate this great day, but with the master of scarce itself? That is to say, it's so stupid it scares any rational person. This Eric Morse's Friday the 13th, the carnival. Jason's on a joyride. It's a real scream! Mitch was a tall and powerful man in his late twenties. Green and red tattoos covered his muscular arms. Mitch liked to boast that he had a tattoo for every girl in every town he'd ever made time with. A guy who boasts about his sex life. I'd say he's a goner, but since he's the first character we're introduced to, and this takes place in a world where Jason's mask does all the killing, I'd say Mitch is the one who puts on Jason's mask and... Well, you know... Morse is nothing if not predictable. Maxie Wagner. Her full name was Maxine, but nobody who knew her even slightly called her that. Was 17 and tall and thin. She had shoulder-length dark hair, large dark eyes, and long legs that seemed to go all the way up to her head. Her voice was so low and sultry that girls accused her of faking it. The various pockets of Maxie's white painter pants were now crammed with Maybelline indigo blue eyeliner, strawberry and pink bubblegum lip gloss, cover stick, cover girl foundation, and black nail polish and a tube of desert sand blush, none of which she had paid for. This is interesting, for two reasons. One. Why does Morse know so much about girl makeup? Two, this girl I just described. I mean, she flaunts her beauty, she shoplifts. She's basically the typical sort of character that doesn't survive a horror movie. Yet this book mainly focuses on her. So you'd think she'll be the one to survive this book, right? Need I remind you that Morse hasn't been very original so far, so why should this book be any different? Catherine Casey Carter was probably one of the sweetest, most polite girls in the history of the entire world. If a killer told Casey he was going to shoot her, she'd probably say, Cool, is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> if she says this to a killer, she'd confuse him and in so doing, survive an attack. This makes her the perfect girl to survive a horror movie. But since we're not focused on her, we already know that she won't make it. Same can be said about every other character that's in this novel. Might as well just write this. Jokes aside now, is this book gonna try to bring us anything new? A number of years ago, a boy named Jason Voorhees had drowned in the lake because of the carelessness of some camp counselors. Tell us something we don't know. Hey, you know what Jesse Kramer told me about Crystal Lake? Maxie asked. He heard it's like the Devil's Gateway, that if you dig down deep enough, this invisible vapor starts seeping up out of the ground, which turns you meaner and nastier the longer you breathe it in. How deep is deep? All week, Vince kept pushing everyone hard. This week was the 4th of July blowout. He constantly reminded them. So all week, the woods of Crystal Lake resounded with sawing, banging, hammering, shouting, cursing, and... It was a strange thing. The longer they spent at Crystal Lake, the nastier the carny workers became. It was like there was something in the air around here, thought Mitch. Not very, apparently. I mean, I can imagine some digging might be done to set up a carnival, but nothing close to, say, six feet under. And even if they'd had to dig six feet, that's hardly deep enough to release anything from hell. Does Morse have any idea of depth? Maybe she should back the party and go to the carnival. After all, it was just one date. One date wouldn't kill her. Well, since you make no effort at making this character likable, we already know that this one date will kill her, so... 
The irony, if it's supposed to be that, is lost. Selena Tokar, the gypsy fortune teller's teenage daughter. All right, almost forgot about Selena. No one had ever made her feel queasy and uncomfortable the way Mitch Deaver did. The way he leered at her. He made Selena feel dirty, like they had already done something together. Something filthy. Wanna bet she's the final girl? I mean, a girl who's disgusted at the very idea of sex, like all the final girls in the movies. But even if you set aside this little cliché, what strikes me as odd here is that she seems to be immune to, the, to those aforementioned gases from hell. Is she any meaner? She feels any strange urges? Does she suddenly change her mind about Mitch? No. Which is weird. I mean, you'd think hell is all about making good people go bad. Are you perhaps saying that Jason never was an innocent boy? That he was born evil, made only worse by the gases that were present in Crystal Lake? Or is it just bad writing? Yeah, it's just bad writing. Stump was staring at his master. Hanging from the dog's mouth was what appeared to be a white mask. Of course it's Jason's mask. Although, given the events of the last book, shouldn't that mask be kept in an evidence locker somewhere? Never mind. Though there was little light in the van, the mask was gleaming. Well, this proves a theory I devised with the last book. That the mask only gets more powerful the more it is used. It didn't make sense then, and it doesn't now. So, there's no point in getting into this any further. From the first hour the fair was open, it was clear to Mitch Deaver that the turnout was going to be lousy. Lousy was putting it mildly, he thought as he strolled through the half-deserted grounds. You know, I actually like the idea of a killer at a carnival. You see, not only does it mean there will be enough potential victims, it also makes the job harder for the killer. After all, he has to kill all these people without being seen. And even if he manages that, or for that matter, even if he were seen, just having to make sure that nobody takes this witness seriously, that would make the killer a true force to be reckoned with. But if there's barely anyone at the carnival, how the hell is he supposed to be terrifying? Mitch was cursing. Only one lousy kid for him to butcher. Where was the fun in that? See? Even your own characters don't like your own ideas. It's pretty bad if the characters are actually smarter than the writer who created them. Mitch's walkie-talkie crackled. Deaver. Mitch pressed the talk button. What's up? Stu and Carl had a fight. Unbelievable, it was the first fist fight today. Anybody die? Very funny. Stu pushed Carl into the fence. Carl's got these horrible burn marks all over his back. It's just used that the voltage on the fence too high. Voltage? They treat fist fights as though they're the most unusual thing in the world, and yet see no problem at putting electric currents on their fences? And I don't think the gas has anything to do with this. They're acting like the electric fences are the most normal thing in the world, so they were like this before they arrived in Crystal Lake. I wonder... The merry-go-round was going too fast, rising and falling, the wooden horses plunged forward wildly, their wooden jaws gaping. Her father's car zoomed back toward the fence. This time the right jammed Dad and Beth against the metal, and the car struck there, holding them in place in a cloudburst of sparks and smoke. Hmm. Welcome to the House of Death! The voice chuckled maniacally. They reached the top of the rise, and a mechanical car turned right, leading them into a room filled with wax figures. Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, 
Maxie had never seen such realistic wax figures in her life. She heard a horrible squelching sound, like sticky footsteps. She turned sharply, and God in heaven, if the Dracula statue didn't seem closer to her than it did a second ago. And I haven't even gotten to the moment where that dog, who dug up Jason's mask, actually kills someone. You know, this doesn't sound too bad. You see, carnival rides tend to look scary to many people already. So the idea of a haunted carnival where the rides have minds their own and kill their attendants... Some would think it's scary just to think about it. However, that would make the presence of a killer completely redundant. Seriously, if the rides kill the people, then there's no point in having a human killer. It's like this was supposed to be about a haunted carnival originally, and Jason just got shoehorned into this story at the last second. Which gets me to think that this whole book is just a product of lazy writing. You see, earlier I mentioned how letting a killer on the loose at a carnival has a lot of potential, seeing as how the killer would have to kill and dump the bodies afterwards, with all those people around to see. If this could be pulled off convincingly, Morse would have been far ahead of his time. But clearly, Morse couldn't come up with anything, so instead, he let the carnival be mostly abandoned and allowed the, the right to be the killers. Sorry, but this just comes off as forced. Not to mention misplaced. Sure, in the movies we've seen someone with telekinetic abilities, and Jason himself has come back from the dead in a Frankensteinian way. And apparently, hell exists in this universe. But the thing is, we read these books because we want to see a killer well, kill people! Perhaps even see him use the rights to his advantage. What we don't want to see is rights coming to life and help the killer. Either the killer haunts the carnival, or the carnival itself is haunted. Putting the two together is plain stupid! This was D. I'm signing off.